Hey everyone, and welcome to the inaugural episode of Eggs Classics, where we feature some of our favorite podcasts from our last four years of making eggs, the podcast. As summer approaches, schedules grow tighter, and on the occasional week where Mike and I cannot get together, like this week, we want to share content that newer listeners may have missed from our amazing back catalog and revisit guests and conversations that we think are worth hearing again. We really value and support the eggs community and each week strive to reward the newbies and the OGs with content sure to enrich your lives with relevant information and topics chosen to help you achieve whatever it is you hope to. So without any further ado, please join me in this special representation of episode number 129 from November 7th, 2019, featuring deep listening expert, keynote speaker and author, Oscar Trimboli. Enjoy. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another exciting episode of Eggs. This week's guest is one we've been looking forward to and actually teased on our last episode because we were looking so forward to it. Uh, today's guest is Oscar Trimboli. Oscar is an expert on deep listening. Uh, one of the things that I have found that I'm not as good at that I should be better at is listening. I was going to say something, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I do believe that this is going to be some great information. Uh, he was kind enough to send us this. It's a great little deck of cards and a book called Deep Listening, uh, Impact Beyond Words. And here to explain it is the man himself, Oscar Trimble. Hey, Oscar. G'day guys, I'm looking forward to listening to your questions today and I can totally relate to the song at the beginning of the episode talking about waking up to the <laughs> trash can <laughs> removal guys and uh, to, today is actually that day in, in Sydney and uh, getting up early, it literally happened as I was preparing for this conversation. <laughs> you didn't get stopped by the police officer, did you? Yeah, that's, no, that's no, part that's of the song, I think. story for another day. <laughs> M- my name is famous in Australia. Uh, it's famous for one of the biggest mafia bob uh, mobsters in Australia. It shares my surname. But, uh, we'll get we'll get to that later on in the episode. Oh, fun. <laughs> All right. Well, that sounds perfect. Well, first things first. I, you know, as I mentioned, we've got this book, Deep Listening. I imagine it took a little bit of life uh, experience to get to writing this thing, uh, which I have found really helpful in the short time I've had to experience it. So I wanted to maybe kind of go back in time a little bit and start at the beginning. How did you, you mentioned in the book that only 2% of people are raised uh, to become great listeners. Most are not. And uh, I wondered if that was the case for you or if there was some event in your life or some, you'd arrived at some place where you decided, you know what, this is something I've got to fix. Yeah, although we spend 50% of our day listening, only 2% of us have been trained. So not necessarily raised, but trained in how to speak. A lot of us by the second, third decade of our life have had between four and five different training courses on how to speak, Mike, but very, very, very few of us have had any training in how to listen. And for me, I'm on a quest to create 100 million deep listeners in the world. And one of the things we should know, listening is our birthright. When we're actually inside our mother's womb at 22 weeks, we can distinguish our mother's voice from any other sound. So we're listening already. And at 32 weeks, we can distinguish Beethoven from Bon Jovi from Beaver. Hmm. So listening is a birthright. But the minute we are born, we come into the world kicking and screaming and making noise and we want to get noticed by talking. So for a lot of us, we forget listening is our birthright. So I think for a lot of us, just remember that if you spend half your day speaking and half your day listening, the more senior you are in an organization or the more complex the kind of work you do, the more likely you're going to spend more of your day listening. Senior executives are spending 83% of their day listening. If you're a creative who takes a brief, for example, you're going to be spending at least 72% of your day listening. So for me, listening's the productivity hack of the 21st century. And there's a bunch of dots along the way, Mike, that kind of pointed to me growing up, how I was listening a little bit differently. I went to a school with 23 different nationalities and we played an Italian card game. 
but we played in teams of two and quite often nationalities would pair off against each other and speak in their home tongue. So you know, when I was growing up, there was wars going on in Vietnam. People were trying to leave Eastern Europe. People were leaving South America. So I was able to hear people play cards in Portuguese, in Chinese, in Russian, in Lithuanian, in Polish, in Yugoslav languages, but I couldn't speak any of them. But what I got really good at, no, it wasn't counting cards. What I got really good at was noticing body language. Yeah. And that's one level that a lot of people don't listen at. Well, so maybe that's a good place to start then. Maybe we should, you know, uh, here in the deep listening book or in this deck of cards, one of the things you start with is sort of identifying these five levels of listening. Do you mind uh, explaining that idea or sort of what these different five levels are? I think that'll sort of give us some context to frame the rest of this conversation. Yeah, the, the five levels of listening are the first level is not listening to the speaker. That's the wrong place to start. Level one, listen to yourself. That's the most critical place to start. Level two, listening to the content. Level three, listening for the context. Level four, listening for what's unsaid. And then level five, listening for meaning. So we can spend a bit of time decomposing those but the research that we've done with 1,410 listeners across the world is 86% of people are stuck in distraction. They're stuck with their cell phone. They're stuck with uh, laptops, iPads, all kinds of visual distractions that are external as well as mental distractions, stories we're telling ourselves in our head, we're turning up to a conversation tuned into the radio station of the last conversation or the next conversation or something we want to do on the weekend, but we're not really tuned into the person who's right there in front of us in the moment. So for a lot of us, we're stuck at level one because we're stuck with distraction. Yeah. How do you kind of overcome that? I mean, you said it's level one for a reason. Why is it the most important one? Yeah, good good point, Mike. They're foundational. You've got to kind of get good at level one before you can even have the capacity to start looking at level two. So let's think about three practical tips to overcome this distraction. Uh, tip number one, think about this as a spectrum. Uh, switch your cell phone off. Now, for a lot of us hearing that, we're just going, I can't go cold turkey <laughs> like that. It's like, I'm going to have to put me in rehab. Yeah. So just switch off the red dots on all your apps. Make sure your apps aren't notifying you at all. If you can do that, that's a great starting point. If you want to move a little bit further forward from that, just switch the phone into silent mode. If you want to move a little bit forward from that, switch the phone to flight mode. And then finally, switch the phone off. One of the biggest gifts you can give people is to give them your attention. In about 2012, a visiting exec from Microsoft Seattle flew to Australia, about a 24-hour flight. And I was hosting Peter in a room full of 20 executives from other companies. And he was an important person. He ran a business with about 30,000 staff members. And he was responsible for billions of dollars of revenue. And I introduced him and he sat at the head position at the table. And he sat down and immediately he stood up. And I thought, oh, no, I've done something <laughs> wrong in the brief. But that wasn't the case. He stood up and apologized to the room. He says, look, the most important thing I can give you right now is my attention. And with that, he took his cell phone out of his top pocket, switched it off, walked over to his bag, placed it in his bag. And for the next 45 minutes, he was completely fixated on the conversation going on. Mike, I'm curious, what do you think happened for the rest of the room when Peter did that? They probably paid better attention themselves. They probably pulled out their phones and switched them into silent mode, and it kind of was a way to open the conversation and get it started. Well, except for that one guy in the back left who was watching his fantasy scores. Who was filming it. <laughs> yeah, that guy. That guy. But he's a problem in every meeting, that guy. Yeah, so I counted, and only three people didn't switch their cell phones off. So you're right about those problem children in the room. They're addicted <laughs> to how important they are. Now, none of them ran a business as big as Peter. So it's an interesting thing to notice. 
Uh, two things struck me in that conversation. Number one, the quality of the conversation that was taking place was very different to a typical meeting that these executives kind of take. The reason they were is because they were actually listening to each other. <clears throat> but the other point is really simple. Every one of us can role model great listening by paying attention to somebody. Now, it won't surprise you that that what Peter did in that moment was a completely orchestrated piece of theatre. He does that at every meeting. Now, he doesn't do it to be a big shot. He does it to role model to everybody that giving attention, not paying attention, but giving attention is the greatest gift you can give. The meeting concluded at the 45-minute mark and Peter left to go to another meeting. And I debriefed the group for the next half an hour. And the thing that struck me was all of them commented on the quality of the conversation. Now, that group, uh, seven years later, still meets in some combination of people, sometimes only six, sometimes up to 12. And they're all in different roles. They're all in different organizations, but they call the, the, the Peter Club. <laughs> a group of people that get together, that switch off their cell phones and pay attention to each other and make a difference. For a lot of us, whether we're parents, whether we're a sibling talking to maybe a cousin, maybe a sister, maybe a brother, do we really give them our attention or are we just completely distracted? So tip number one, switch it off. The same with laptops, the same with iPads. Tip number two, uh, a hydrated brain is a listening brain. The, the brain is 5% of body mass, but it consumes 26% of blood sugar. So the fastest way to get blood sugar to the brain is just to drink water. Does beer so work? It, it, it does. <laughs> it has a reverse it does. It, it, it <laughs> Sorry, lubricates I'm, I'm the conversation <laughs> really well. Yeah. And... <laughs> And if you drink coffee, um, probably a glass of water for every cup of coffee you have plus one. So for me, I, I always make sure there's water there for my guests if I go and visit a client. And it, it just it makes a point that at the end of the day, because none of us have been taught how to listen, it's a really complex task. It happens at the front of the brain, the more modern brain, the prefrontal cortex. And for a lot of people, when they start off on the journey with me, they go, gee, this listening is hard. And I say, you're doing it the wrong way. And, and the third point is breathing. The deeper you breathe, the deeper you listen. Most of us aren't even aware of our breathing. We're not even aware of the breathing of the person we're listening to. So, Mike, for your question, three things to improve and build a foundation to be a deep listener. Number one, remove the distractions. Number two, drink water. Number three, notice your breathing. And for me, it's just a simple practice. When I step into a building, the minute I cross the lobby, my phone goes off, it goes in my bag, from the time I walk across the lobby into the lift, what I do from that point on, I just take three deep breaths. Now, about four weeks ago, my ears popped because I went to a high-rise building, 42 stories, and my ears popped about halfway, which completely threw me. <laughs> so, so rather than turning left to go to reception, I turned right and went to the restrooms, just collected my thoughts, three deep breaths, back at it. And then when I arrived at reception, they offered me refreshments. I said, look, I'd love a jug of water for me and the, and the people we're seeing. And that, that's as simple as it is. But if you've got those three foundations in place, listening becomes really easy after that. But for most of us, that's where we'll struggle. Interesting. Well, so there's a couple of things you brought up in there that I'd like to dig in a little bit more on. You know, I, I'd like to talk a little more about breath, especially. Uh, also, uh, I've got a couple of questions about removing distractions. But one of the things you mentioned a couple of times in there was the quality of the conversation that you had with Peter and how how – people remarked about just the the quality, not, you know, what he talked about, not how long it was, whatever, but like the actual quality of that conversation. I wondered if you could talk a little bit about that and talk about sort of like, you know, what metrics by which do we measure quality of conversation? Like, how do we know that this was good quality? What do you, can you maybe elaborate on that idea a little? The most typical one that people notice the fastest is the lack of interruption, allowing people to fully complete what they're saying rather than jumping in and thinking what they said the first time is what matters. It's a really important, 
bit of neuroscience we need to know at this point. I speak at about 125 words a minute. A cattle auctioneer might speak at about 200 words a minute as they're auctioning off the cattle at the cattle yards, but we can still comprehend at 200 words a minute. In my head though, and for all of us, we have about 900 words a minute stuck in our head. So the first thing that comes out of our mouth, there's about an 11% chance that the first thing I say is what I mean. So the minute you interrupt somebody, you actually assault their thinking. You don't let them fully express what they say. So the most common thing people correlate to high quality conversations is the lack of interruption. In the West, we have a weird relationship with silence. In the East, silence is revered, it's respected, it's a sign of authority, it's a sign of wisdom. Yet in the West, we say awkward silence, <laughs> pregnant yeah. pause. We have a weird kind of relationship with silence. So the second part of a high quality conversation is just letting silence sit in the room to do a bit of work. The third part of the conversation about high quality conversations is the backstory is fully explained. For those of you who ever take briefs, whether you're a doctor, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're in agency land, whether you're an accountant, whether you're a lawyer, whether you're a market researcher or an architect, the biggest reason your briefs blow up if you win the work is because you don't fully understand the backstory. And for a lot of us, we spend too much time listening to what people are saying in the moment rather than understanding the context of where that comes from. So a couple of simple questions might be, how long have you been thinking about this issue? That's a really good sign, Ryan, of a high quality question. Now, questions that are high quality typically are five to seven words, no more, because after that, the question becomes a statement, really. It's you're just voicing your opinion and you're putting a question mark at the end of it. So. Number one, no interruptions. Number two, silence is used a lot more. And number three, high quality questions that are less than five words that are seeking to explore what other 800 words the speaker still hasn't said. Now, there are some magic code words, but we'll talk about that in a sec when we know the speakers explain what they mean. Interesting. Yeah. So you, I think what you were talking to, if I've got it right, is basically you've got this thing in the book called the 125 over 400 rule. And is mm. that basically that's this ratio of number of words we can communicate versus number of words in our head, if I've got it correct. So there's, there's two, two rules. The 125 400 rule, I can speak at 125 words a minute. You can listen at 400 words a minute and I can think at 900 words a minute. So there's two kind of simultaneous mathematical equations going on, that's why listening is hard. So Ryan, to the point, I speak at 125 words a minute, you listen at 400 words a minute, and for those who are listening to this right now, you're getting distracted because I'm speaking too slowly for you and you might be commuting, you might be in a car, you might be on a plane, you might be on a train. But right now you're filling in the gaps because I'm not speaking fast enough. And that's the internal element of distraction. You're filling in 300 words in your own head because you can listen faster than I can speak. If you ever want to do this test, simply play this recording back at two times speed and you'll be able to listen to it with near perfect comprehension. Once you start to move to 300, you're at the edge without training. So Ryan, in that moment, we got to know that we will be distracted and I'm not a perfect listener. I want to be clear about that. The difference between you and me is I just notice when I get distracted faster than you do. Is it because you're attentive to that or is it because I'll listen to audiobooks and sometimes I'll miss a whole chapter and have to go back and listen to it again before my brain clicks on and says, hey, you weren't paying attention to that. Yeah. And one of the funniest stories I ever heard was a lady called Claire was commuting to work and sent me a message after she heard me on a podcast going, Oscar, the minute you said it's happening to you right now, 
I realized in that <laughs> moment it was happening to me right now. And Ding. Mike, she, she did exactly what you did. She pressed rewind and went back. So for a lot of us, just becoming conscious of the fact we're being distracted is an interesting practice for us to get better at. And because we have no training, because we've never been taught what good listening looks like, we can drift through a whole chapter in an audible book. And you may even be playing it at one and a half times speed because uh, you want to get it through it quicker. So for me, if you're listening at five levels, rather than listening to sentences, stories, you have to listen differently. So for me, when I'm listening to people, I'm going, do they consistently talk in the past or the future? Are they consistently talking about positives or negatives? Are they consistently talking about themselves or their team? So once you start listening at all five levels simultaneously, you can't help but be fascinated. You can't help but be engaged. Here's a little working definition for you, though. The difference between hearing and listening is your willingness to have your mind changed. And if you're willing to have your mind changed, you listen completely differently. You listen for differences and similarities. You go into the conversation with heightened sense of curiosity and your, your head's just exploding going, this is the most fascinating conversation I've ever heard. Now, for most of us, that's not true because we make up a story that's a filter in front of the conversation. Oh, well, here we go with Mike again <laughs> on that thing. And I'm not listening to Mike. I'm listening to the radio station frequency I've created in my own head that's blocking me being able to listen effectively to Mike. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, there's uh, countless times where you kind of go in with like a pre-determined idea of the conversation, and and then as it progresses, I'm pleasantly surprised. Um, you know, I, I go in thinking, "Oh, this is going to be horrible," and then uh, the conversation goes great, and it, it's it's all in your head. Is there a way to kind of like um, prep to to come into a conversation and get that out of the way and just kind of be ready for? Uh, focused listening instead of passive listening. Well, yeah, th to that point, that was actually one of the things I wanted to bring up here shortly. So at the, at the beginning of the book, or at the beginning of this book, at the beginning of Deep Listening, uh, you use a anecdote about a woman named Mary who's running around meeting to meeting to meeting and, you mm. know, is lost in thought between things and, and all this. And I, for me, I was having PTSD of my days back in the ad agency <laughs> because this was my life too. <laughs> And so, uh, so for me, I, I could totally relate to Mary's situation where she was going, you know, from one thing to one thing. And as you say, you know, she sort of put up this thing inside her mind. She was already thinking about the next meeting while she was enduring this one or, you know, different, different situations like that. And so we did talk a little bit about uh, overcoming distraction, but it seems like maybe this bit of distraction, you know, beyond just being a cell phone or whatever, it's quieting this voice in your head. Do you have any yeah. ideas or any any pointers you'd be willing to share to sort of, I guess, answer Mike's question, but sort of elaborate on it with this one? Yeah. Ryan, the funniest thing is about nine of my clients all rang me up when the book came out and go, that's me in the book, isn't it? <laughs> it's like the story is so universal in modern workplaces. And whether that's going from meeting to meeting to meeting, or if you're freelancing, you might be going from call to call to call or project to project to project. The tip is just notice your breathing. If you can notice your breathing, you'll still your mind so much more than you can even imagine. Uh, I've interviewed a number of experts in breathing, both from the East and from the West, as in what does just taking three deep breaths do? Now, ideally, you should be taking three deep breaths as a minimum. That's why I say three deep breaths. That will take you to about 30 seconds. If you can hold and take in a deep breath, for it's about 10 seconds if you're doing it properly. So most of us, for example, breathe through our mouth and not through our nose. So you should be breathing in through your nose, down your throat, all the way to the bottom of your lungs, and then exhale through your mouth. Now, are you now taking... I, sorry to interrupt, because... Uh, 
I'll, I'll do this myself, but uh, I take deep breaths and I hold it for a second and then I exhale slowly. Is that the proper technique or you don't, don't hold it? Because I don't know if I'm doing it correctly. I just kind of made it my own version of meditating. Or... <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so you don't want to kind of get it stuck. You just want it to get it to touch the bottom of your lungs and, and then exhale. When you hold your breath, you're actually sending a fight signal to the rest of the body to say, hey, I'm in a situation that I might be in trouble, so I want to take all the resources into my body and really heighten my nervous system. Uh, this would not be a helpful listening state in this case, Mike. So it, it should feel really natural, but for most of us, whether we're anxious about a situation, we're frustrated about a situation, the most natural place for us to do is to actually hold our breath but most of us never notice that. So good noticing there, Mike. So Thank you. in through your nose, right down to your lungs, then back up and out. Now, about five years ago, Google started to implement a program inside their workplace for large team meetings, more than three people. They would start the meeting with three minutes of silence. And it was... For some people, they use it as a guided meditation. For others, just three minutes of silence. And they, being Google, they tracked all of this. And those meetings that used the three minutes of silence before that felt that they had high quality outcomes. And more importantly, the meetings were shorter. So that simple act of noticing your breathing will make a massive difference. The step above that is to start to notice the breathing of the person you're speaking to as well. Because if you notice they're holding your breath, their breath, uh, that might be a signal to you to go, hey, they might be uncomfortable with this topic or this topic might be holding them back. Or equally, you just might want to help slow them down by just using silence a little bit more prior to responding to what they say. Silence is interesting and something that, you know, Ryan, you probably added yourself already as the interrupting listener. <laughs> and for the tips for the interrupting listener, treat silence like it's a word. Listen to the beginning of silence, the middle of silence, and the end of silence. Treat silence with respect and you'll be shocked at what you hear back, what you'll hear back. And I'll be curious if you've heard these magical code words that come back from the speaker. If you allow some silence to do the work, to do the heavy lifting, as Dr. David Rock would say, they will do these things. They will go, well, actually, Ryan, what we should be talking about, or they'll say, Mike, what matters the most to me right now isn't what we've talked about so far. Can we talk about this? Or they'll say, now that I've thought about it, can we talk about, and off they go. These code words consistently come about if you've taken the time to help them listen to those other 800 words stuck in their head. And I, uh, Mike's nodding furiously. I'm curious <laughs> if, if you found yourself in those situations, um, Mike, and what happens to the quality of the conversation as a result of you just listening a little longer? Well, I, I think that having the time to process the, your thoughts before replying is good. Um, it, it's part of the act, I, I feel, is part of active listening is uh, – listen to what they say, take it in, take that deep breath, and then reply after you've gathered your thoughts instead of just going into it half-cocked and trying to come up with a reply on the fly. I think it's better to just kind of process and then reply. I don't know if that's, you know, your theory or your your process. I haven't read the book yet, but uh, I, I know that uh, in the podcasts that I've done in the past, the guests that will actually sit there ponder the question and then reply, I usually get the better responses and the more uh, better answers in my opinion, I, I guess. It, yeah, I'm a, a massive student of uh, Terry Gross from Fresh Air and uh, she's an amazing interviewer and she her second questions are always where the conversation lights up that really gets you engaged. And again, for a lot of us, we want to reply. 
here's an interesting thing to think about listening. It's not your job to make sense of what the speaker's saying. It's your job to help the speaker make sense of what they're thinking. So the follow-up question is almost as important as, or more important as the first one. Yeah, and the follow-up question is so simple. I'll give you a couple of versions of it. Tell me more. That works. What else? Is there anything else? So all those are less than five words, and all it does is it honors it gives attention to the speaker and then they go and pull out of their head what they actually mean because most of us have conversations like drive-by shootings we listen to the first thing we say the first thing and the first thing and the first thing and they just bump off each other but it's not what we mean and if we just took a little bit of extra time if we took the time in the briefing process uh, in any kind of brief that you might take from a client or if you're in a sales situation, if you simply said, you know, they said, oh, you know, we, we're struggling with this and we need this and, and can you sell us one of those? If you just said, tell me more, they'll say things like, well, the last time we did a project like this, finance was all over us, so we need to watch out for that. You know, they've just given you an objection you need to overcome. And you just say, what else? They'll say, oh, you know, the things we need to anticipate on this project are X, Y, and Z. All of a sudden, you've got a landscape that you can think through a little bit more differently. Every project that's ever failed is because we've listened to what people say the first time, not to what they mean. And in their head, they're frustrated because they're going, oh, I should have told Mike this. But the only time it ever happens is when you're shaking hands at the lift or occasionally when you come back at the end, it's a second meeting and they go, hey, before we start, two things I didn't tell you at the last meeting. And you go, oh, my God, that changes everything. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's funny that you say that. Like I'm going through a, a deal with a client right now where we have, we've gotten approval on the website we're building for them twice. And yet they called me today with all new round of changes. And it's exactly what you're talking about. It's the, the things that keep occurring to them because, you know, I didn't do my part up front to get all this out of them. So, mm. and it's also funny, just an interesting observation as you were giving those sort of three rebuttals, you know, the, the tell me mores, I could feel myself welling up between those pauses. Like I just, I had to say something. Like I needed to <laughs> fill that silence, silence with something. <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was really funny because I'm being extra aware because we're talking to you, but I could feel myself like, ooh, I need to say something. So anyway. Uh, look, and, and Ryan, <laughs> for that for that situation, when we think about level three listening and the playing cards are awesome at this, uh, one, of, one of my clients is in tech and they use the cards to try and figure out what kind of questions they haven't asked the client. So one of the things we're really good at, typically beating the competition, selling the solution. That's interesting, but it's not useful for the client. What's useful for the client is your job is to help them sell the business case internally. And most of us stop when we've won. That's not helpful for them. That means you're listening at level two, not level three, and you're not listening at level four for what's not said. So a simple question would be, uh, Ryan, hey, who else needs to approve this? Yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. I wish I, I wish I had had this conversation a week ago. Can you, um, <laughs> you, you're locked and loaded for the next one. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I can't wait. Now I'm lo I'm looking forward to the next round of revisions. So uh, we've we've touched on the game a little bit. I haven't looked through it. I apologize, but could you break that down for us? What it is and and how you can apply the game into learning how to listen better. So the playing cards are designed much like a deck of cards. Um, it kind of came about by listening to a client in a workshop, funnily enough. We were using sticky notes. Thanks, Ryan. He's yeah. uh, giving, doing, do, Van doing the moment. TV yeah. <laughs> version of this. And what happened, we were, we were doing a lot of work about what people were struggling with when it came to listening and what they were going to do about it. And they were simply sticky notes. We're going back nearly five, six years ago now, early days for me encoding what was in my head and what my experience set was and what it was for learning for clients. And at, at the break, afternoon, around about 3 p.m., uh, 
I'd send everybody out for a refreshment break, clear their minds, ask them to go walk around the block, get some fresh air. And one lady was hanging around and Alice said to me, you aren't going to take my card down. I said, oh, Alice, which one's your card? And she, she went over, she grabbed this sticky note, and all of a sudden I realized people were putting much more meaning to these sticky notes than anything else. And I, and I spoke to my book editor about it, Mike, and she said to me, Oscar, make cards. And I went, oh, Kel, that's so obvious. So the cards are there to help people practice daily. Listening is a skill, yes, but it's also a strategy and it's also a practice. You're just never going to get perfect at it. You just have to get better every day. So five suits in the deep listening playing card deck and 10 cards in each suit. And each card is organized to make a simple statement. So there's one there about silence, for example. And it says, can I be a little bit more comfortable with silence than I normally would be? So what happens is people use these cards in very different ways. Some people just use the cards themselves and practice with one card per week. They don't tell anybody. They just go, oh, okay, I'm going to work with silence this week. And they just practice. Some, sometimes, sometimes I get emails from people going, I'm really struggling with this. Any other extra tips? And sometimes they get breakthroughs. So that's really cool when people say that to me as well. Some people go one card per week for 50 weeks of the year. And that's a really good practice. That's probably where people get really consistent. People use them in team meetings. Uh, talked about the sales meeting earlier on, but some uh, leaders use them for leadership offsites and they pick one card and go, this card will be how we think about listening for the rest of this hour, day, three days, weekend, whatever the case may be. And the cards are simply there as a reminder. Um, they feel a little different. They're designed to feel a little different. They're made to be oversized again to feel a little different. And those cards are really there to help us move from knowing to applying. Because too many of us go on courses or learn new knowledge, but we never apply it. Now, if I could brag about one amazing book that's not mine, Atomic Habits. That's a good one. By James Clear. Yeah. He, that guy is absolutely brilliant. The way he explains habits and how well he writes about it, it's probably the best written business book, nonfiction, that I've ever read in the 35 years I've been reading business books. And he says that you've got to break habits down into its absolute smallest components. So he would say, if you want a habit to go to the gym, that's not the habit you need to practice with. The habit you need to practice with is before you go to bed every night, put your shoes and your gym gear next to your bed. So the first thing that happens when you step out of bed is you either have to step over your clothes or step into your clothes. But too many of us think about which gym membership and uh, uh, should I should I go CrossFit or should I go, you know, working out with lifting weights? This is a wrong question. Make it even simpler. Make sure your clothes are next to your bed when you step out in the morning. And if you do that for a week, then worry about the gym. So for a lot of us, we want to know the ninja move of, of listening, which is, by the way, level four, listening to what's unsaid. If Yoda was on this podcast, he'd be speaking about level four for this whole thing. But most of us aren't even there. We need to step out of the bed and have the clothes next to us. And that's what the playing cards are there for. Yeah. yeah, no, actually, we've got Yoda in a week or two, so that'll, that'll be great. <laughs> um, so I wanted to go back to another thing you said in the book. I thought it was kind of interesting. For me, it felt controversial. Maybe it's not, but I think it's like a maybe a twist or a, another way of looking at things. Uh, one of the things you say is that the most important person in the conversation is not the speaker. And you talked about that a little bit in level one, being listening to yourself. And so I wanted to sort of tie those two ideas together. If you could, first of all, explain why the, the speaker isn't number one, and then maybe dig in a little bit on this idea of listening to self, because a, at least on its face, listening to self sounds to me like listening to all the crazy things in my head that are distracting me from everything else. So I was curious if you could sort of break down those two topics. 
So the first one is really critical. Most of us are dialed into those crazy voices in our head, so we can't even be available to the speaker. So if, Ryan, I was to fixate and focus on the speaker before I turn up to the conversation, what are they worried about? What are they going to do? I'm not even ready. I need to get ready for the conversation. So before we turn up to the conversation would be the distinction I make. Before we turn up to the conversation, in that moment where we're sitting in front of them and we haven't shared a word yet, you are what matters. Because yeah, you got the crazies in your head. The crazies are going, why are you here? You got better things to do. Oh, the last time we were here, we just got stuck in a drama. Oh, I'm not sure I really want to work for this client. Oh, this is going to be really expensive. Oh, gee, I hope you know, you just dialed into the wrong frequency as opposed to three deep breaths, drink a glass of water, right, I'm present here now. Now, once you are present, yeah, we can move our attention to the speaker, but most of us are stuck here. Most of us are in this amazing dialogue with ourselves and all the voices inside our head. You know, you'll see a couple of characters in the, in the graphics in the book where we've got, you know, an angel and a, and a devil consistently talking to people because we have those voices going on in our head. To be effective, to be productive as a listener, it's you can't be productive if you're just listening to interrupt, listening to reply. None of that matters. You can't be in a state of comfort to say, tell me more, if all you're trying to do is figure out how to reply. Yeah. And if you're not ready, if you're not set up, if you're not in those gym clothes when you're having that conversation, it's going to be a really superficial and unproductive conversation. And for you, Ryan, the clients come back twice and they might come back a third time now because you've got a whole bunch of rework to do and that's really frustrating. So for most of us, we just need to prepare ourselves for the act of listening. Now, once we're ready, then we move our attention to the speaker because, as I said earlier on, it's not your job to make sense of what they're saying. It's your job to help them make sense of what they're thinking. Yeah, I can't. That's what a deep listener does. I can't tell you how many times I wanted to interrupt you and say what I'm about to say right now. <laughs> it, it's like in in my head, I've got this idea that, that oh, I can I can reply to this. I can re I have something good, but um, it's hard to just shut up and let the person who's the guest or the person you're trying to glean the information from speak. Um, it, it's it's definitely something that uh, I need to focus on. I'm sure Ryan needs to focus well, on. Well, normally well. normally I'm the biggest offender. I am being particularly self conscious today. So, <laughs> yeah, so I am not. I've, I've, I've listened to five of you your <laughs> podcasts, and you guys are on a different plane today. <laughs> that's right. No messing I've around. Been today. role modeling some deep listening, and you guys are mirroring their back. That's, that's right. Funny. I'm trying hard. I'm trying hard because you know today Mike is not being critical of me interrupting. I'm being critical of him interrupting. Hey, I have only interrupted <laughs> once. <laughs> I heard a couple uhs and ahs in there. I tried, you, I, I tried, I doing. held back. <laughs> um, so I guess, so sort of to that end, and I don't know, we, we've sort of circled around this a little bit, but I want to kind of form it into more of a pointed question. Does it make sense, I mean, if we're trying to, you know, be in a position to listen to ourselves and, you know, be prepared to go listen to this speaker, does it make sense to sort of be capable of, I guess, self-diagnosing our current level of listening? Does it make sense to understand where we are to be able to fix it. Uh, one of the things you call out in the book are these different types of listeners. And I wondered if it made sense uh, as part of this process, uh, you know, as we're learning to be better listeners, if we understand, you know, our, our characteristics so that we better know how to overcome them. Yeah, I, I think it makes complete sense. And the, the four villains of listening were, were birthed out of complete frustration. For two years, I was blogging, I was writing about what it takes to be a great listener. And I, I got really frustrated and I experimented with something in a workshop and I was going, okay, stop listening for where they're great, start listening to where they're struggling. And it was my learning. It was my journey to go on. I needed to learn to listen in a way that I wanted to have my mind changed. And I started to develop this, oh, I'm noticing there's an interrupting listening villain showing up. There's a dramatic listening villain showing up. There's a lost listener showing up. There's a shrewd listener 
showing up. And I wrote a blog post a couple of weeks later, Ryan, about the four villains of listening. And it, it just went mental. Thousands of shares, hundreds of comments, thousands of likes, and people were tagging their friends saying, uh, this hey, is you. <laughs> hey, right. well, no, they were they were a little bit more sensitive than that. They tagged the person's name and saying, "Is this your boss? <laughs> is this your coworker?" So all of a sudden, as people were tagging each other, this thing just went crazy, and I just went, "Oh my goodness, you've completely missed the point, Oscar." People haven't been trained in how to listen so they don't realize what good is but they certainly know what bad is and most people notice what's bad in others before they notice what's bad in themselves so these four villains of listening came to life so the interrupting listener is the most obvious it's the most overt the interrupting listener is actually coming from a place of good intention they want to help they want to get to the solution quicker they just do it by interrupting the lost listener is either stuck in their own head. They kind of go, hmm, I've been invited to this meeting, so I'm going to turn up and <laughs> I hope by the 15-minute mark I'll understand why I'm here. And, but they look really vague for the first 15 minutes of any conversation um, because they're not sure why they're there. The other place the lost listener shows up win is they know why they're at the meeting, but they spend all their time on their cell phone. So they're completely lost to the conversation there as well. The dramatic listener loves, loves, loves your story, particularly the, the feeling part of your story. They love it. And the reason they love it is they can tell a bigger story. If you're going through a tough merger, in your organization, they'll tell you about a time that theirs was tougher. If you're struggling with your boss, they're going to tell you why the boss they've had is even worse. Mm -hmm. It kind of brought together by a story that uh, Kathy told me once. Kathy said she went in to see her boss, her manager. She wanted to go to her grandmother's funeral on a Wednesday. So she was asking permission on a Monday to go to a funeral on a Wednesday. She said to her boss, is it okay if I go to the funeral on Wednesday? And 12 minutes later, her boss had finished saying how tough her grandmother's funeral was, how she really hasn't come overcome it, and she's still struggling with lots of elements, to which mm. Kathy replied, so is it okay for me to go to the <laughs> funeral on Wednesday? <laughs> so the dramatic listener shows up at beer o'clock a lot. You know, it's typically lubricated by some other kind of um, – uh, liquid other than only water. And then the shrewd listener. Oh my goodness, we think they're the rock stars of listening. They kind of do this while they're listening. They've got their hand up to their chin or they're <laughs> stroking the side of their jaw. They're thinking really carefully. But the subtitles or the captioning that might be going on is, Oh my God, I cannot believe you think that's your problem. I've thought of three other problems you haven't even thought of. That is so basic. Oh yeah, I can fix that. But can can you give me a tough one? Because I'm I'm kind of sophisticated. I'm fancy pants expert. <laughs> I know all of all about this. Now the shrewd listener disproportionately represented in our database and sales professions in any kind of brief taking professions, lawyers, accountants, doctors, physical therapists and the like. And you're not listening as a shrewd listener. You're listening to the dialogue in your own head, although you're giving them great face and they feel like you're listening because you go, mm -hmm, tell me more. You're not. Your intent is to show how much of an expert you are and that's not listening. You need to meet them where they're at. And if they've got basic problems, you need to sit in that moment with their basic problems. So the four villains of listening, you probably related to somebody in one of these four villains while you were listening to me. You were either relating really well to the dramatic listener, the lost listener, the shrewd or the interrupting listener. Whichever one of those listeners you were really frustrated by the most is the listening villain you probably are. Oh. It's true, Mike. I was thinking about someone, Mike, 
<laughs> so no, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Mike's what? actually not the problem, but I, I was thinking of people uh, like that. To your point, I I was thinking of the guy that that consistently one ups you because um, I've yeah. had I've dealt with people like that, and it's so frustrating because you want to just like slap them and be like, that wasn't what I was trying to do. I was just trying to tell you what I'm feeling, and you got a better yeah. story. Good job, <laughs> you know. And so. listening is situational and relational, so we'll be different villains at different times. So in the workplace, I'm the shrewd listener. You know, I'm there going, oh, my goodness, I got five levels of listening, although I spend a lot of my time going, is there a level zero, is there a level six? So I'll play with, <laughs> with that kind of tension as well. Uh, but at home, I'm a lost listener. It's like, oh, my goodness, if I hear my in-laws tell a story one more time about 13A Orchards Road in Johannesburg, South Africa, Oh, I could paint a picture of what that place looks like because I've heard the stories over and over and over again. And they love telling these stories. And the minute a new person comes into the group, out come the stories, but I'm lost. So for us, we need to think about if listening is situational or relational, we'll listen differently to a parent than we will to school principal. We'll listen differently to a doctor than we will to a policeman we will be different listening villains at different points in time. The point isn't, will you be a listening villain or which listening villain you are? It's like, just notice it and then just simply come back to those three guiding principles as a starting point. If you remove distractions, if you conscious of your breath, if you drink water, you're going to be ahead of 86% of people. If you pass that, just be in a good relationship with silence and ask those words, tell me more, what else? If you can do that, you can make a difference beyond words. But I'm always reminded of the story of Mick who rang me about two years ago. I was working with him for about 90 days and he rang me up on a Monday morning while I was driving to work and he was driving to work. He said, Oscar, you nearly cost me my marriage last Friday night. <laughs> and I said, tell me more. And, <laughs> Good and, listening. And he, <laughs> and he said, Oscar, it was about 7.30, we'd put the kids to bed, we'd cleared all the dishes, the dinner table was completely cleared, and my wife looked at me and said those words you never want to hear. Mick, we need to talk. Uh -huh. <laughs> so with that, they both sat down at the dinner table. Now, one of the things you can do to physically improve your listening Try, if you can, not to sit directly opposite somebody. If you can sit without a table, even better. But Mick had lined himself up on a diagonal with his wife. She said, look, I just want you to tell me the truth. I can handle the truth. Please don't make up stories. I know for the last 90 days you've been having an affair. So just tell me who it is and we can agree and move on. Now, Mick says to me, in his head, he was exploding. He was getting angry. He was getting frustrated. But in that moment, he said, Oscar would say, just breathe and say, tell me more. So he did. He said, tell me more. And she said, for the last 90 days, it's obvious you're having an affair. You've never, ever in our whole 12 years of married, marriage paid me so much attention as you have in the last 90 days. Huh. So I know something's changed. <laughs> and Mick looks her in the eye and says, it's not what you think. And she explodes and she says, I don't want excuses. Just tell me who it is and we can decide what we do about it. And Mick's kind of a cheeky guy and he said, well, actually, it's a man. <laughs> <laughs> it's Oscar. <laughs> and with that, she burst out crying because she jumped to a completely different assumption. And he, and he stopped her. He said, no, 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 it's, it's a guy who's teaching me how to listen for the last 90 days. And he told me not to practice it at home, only at work. And now I realize why he's told me that. And she goes, what are you talking about? He goes, I've been working with this guy at work who's been teaching me how to listen better. And it's all about me giving attention to the people there. She says, yeah, that's what I've been noticing. She says, I've never felt sexier than I have in the last 90 days. You've never paid me this much attention in a whole 12 years of marriage. That's why I knew you had to be having an affair. 
Now, the rest of the story is X-rated and I can't find <laughs> on, on your podcast, but the, the rest of the night was enjoyable. Let's just say that. <laughs> and then the next morning he left with his new male friend. And you get... <laughs> no, that's awesome. But can you see how powerful just paying attention to somebody is? How people are just craving to be noticed and people craving to be heard and people craving to be listened to. But most of us are just trying to get our point across in the conversation. Well, and that's, Very true. that sort of segues into sort of the next thing I had written here to talk to you about. And that was sort of the benefits of deep listening and relationships. So I think there are a lot of these things that are sort of on the surface, right? I mean, obviously, better listening equals better business or better whatever, you know. But I wonder if you could sort of point out some of these benefits just to maybe draw a little extra attention to them. So in the workplace, your meetings will actually be shorter. You'll get more time in your day. When I work with people in corporations, I promise them that over a week, you'll get four hours a week back in your schedule because you're not going back and re-explaining things to people. As we've just heard with Ryan, he's got a client who's come back and again and re-explaining what the brief really is. No, 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 that wasn't my brief. This was actually my brief. So it, it costs us time. So the benefits are meetings are shorter. It, the benefits are that it's more profitable to do it this way as well because costs are surfaced faster. We have the right kind of conversations about what's missing from a solution, a project or whatever. But more importantly, we enjoy different relationships with members of staff. We enjoy different relationships with customers. If you pay attention to customers the way Mick was paying attention to his wife, you can't help but get more business because your competitors aren't listening to your customers. They're trying to transact with them. And if you listen to your customers, they will fill your sales pipeline, not just with the current problem they've got, but when you say, tell me more, they'll explain what you can sell to them after this, and then after that as well, and then after that as well. For sales organizations, typically they have pipelines that look like hourglasses. They kind of narrow at the top, they bulge out in the middle, and they get really tiny at the bottom. So one of the benefits of listening is that sales pipeline takes a different, more streamlined shape because the reason it bulges out in the middle, you're having the wrong conversations with people because you're not listening to their problems. And if you listen to their problems, you can decide much faster whether they're, you're a good match for them or more importantly, can you refer somebody to them who can actually solve that problem to them? And in doing so, you'll be a problem solver. One of the things I kind of giggle about is I have a prospect I tried to sell to five years ago. We've never done any work together. But in that first meeting, I said to him, I said, look, Peter, I'm not the right person for you, but I can recommend two people who are. And he chose one of those two people and went on to work with them. Peter has referred me more work than any of my client base. And I've never worked with him because I actually solved his problem back on day one. I was listening carefully to what he needed. I just couldn't provide it. So one of the things that might go up for you as a benefit is referrals. At home, I'm not going to promise everybody's going to have a relationship with their spouse like Mick, but your relationship will improve and you will be present long enough to be paying attention to start to have the conversations that matter rather than the superficial conversations about taking out the trash, chopping up the vegetables or whatever else might be taking place. There'll be less chaos and conflict and confusion in your relationships as well. I always remember this speech by a guy called Brian who gave from the stage. He was an expert in world peace. Mm -hmm. And he gets this question all the time, you know, hey, Brian, I've heard what you've said today, but how can I go out there and change the world and bring about world peace? And he said something very profound that stayed with me for the rest of my life. Bring peace to your home and the rest of the world will follow. You can't have a peaceful world if you don't have a peaceful life at home. Makes sense. So for me, that's true for listening too. you know. I always say when I speak from stage or in training rooms, do not go and try this at home because the people haven't been briefed 
on these principles so they will feel it's a bit weird when you do this. Explain you've been on a training course and that you're trying some things, but you're trying them in the workplace. But as you can see with Mick, it just leaks into your whole life, not just your work life as well. Are there any things that you can kind of say you're dealing with a bad listener at work or, or they're not paying attention in meetings? Are there some subliminal things you can do to maybe help them kind of take it in better or pass that on to them? Where I don't know. I, I, it, as the person speaking, um, are there things that you can do that can help them listen better? Oh, there's quite a range of things. So one of the things we need to be conscious of, a speaker also has a responsibility to help the listener listen. And I was on, I was on a TV show and, and the host just said to me, oh, Oscar, I don't listen to people just because they're boring. <laughs> they just drone on and, you know, it's really hard. And he looked at me in the eyes expecting a really um, – sublime sophisticated answer and i just said sorry joe could you say that again and (laughs) (laughs) so for a lot of us uh we love to tell stories that's great uh tell them why the story why you're telling the story that's helpful hey i'm just going to give you a bit of background it's a story about some listeners relate better to numbers details statistics than just to stories pictures and things like that. So as a listener, uh, sorry, as a speaker, if you don't know your audience, so today I've done a mixture of stories and statistics, I want to be able to speak to both sides of the brain for those people listening. The other thing uh, you can do as a speaker to help the listener is, again, do what I did today and just pause and invite comment. Because that moves it from a monologue to a dialogue. Yeah, that that does help. Have yeah. you noticed me doing that today, by the oh, way? Oh, I picked up on yeah. it all the time. It's it's like you said, it's that awkward silence. Yeah, see, you've you been know? luring him in. I've been I've been good though. <laughs> so, but just this once, just this once. By next week, I'll be interrupting with everybody. Again. Yeah. So, but I wondered maybe to that end, you know, we've only got a, a few minutes left with you, but I wondered. You know, one of the big things we talked about, and as we're experiencing, you know, just now, is is discomfort in silence. Um, is there something, or can you share some tips on on how to become more comfortable with it? I, I suspect, and this is, it won't be super satisfying, but I suspect it's probably got something to do with practice and repetition. <laughs> but I wonder if you've got that magic bullet. Oh, you took the words right out of my mouth. <laughs> but let, let's let's go back uh, and practice. Tell me more about discomfort. Okay. Are you asking or asking? <laughs> so I'm asking you, Ryan. Got Tell it. me more about so discomfort. So as, as I mentioned earlier, when you, uh, you were telling us about the, the different things you can say, you know, the, the tell me more type questions that, that we would share with somebody if we're trying to, you know, I guess sort of prove our, our depth of listening, you know, I sort of admitted to feeling this sort of sense or the sensation welling up in me that I needed to just blurt something out. Like it wasn't important. I didn't have a thought. It was just, oh my God, I must fill this silence with something. So this discomfort, at least the way I experience it, is that it's some kind of sensation or something where it's ingrained in me, maybe as a Westerner, and I feel like I must constantly be talking or, uh, or something. Maybe it's too much caffeine in the mornings. But whatever it is, there's there's something inside me that when given a window like that, I feel like I must inject. Now, I you know, like I said, I, I mean, I'm making a conscious effort to be disciplined today, but largely I probably would have jumped into those well, things. Well, and, and to your credit, we are hosting a podcast, so silence is kind of out of the norm. Uh, but yes. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> so, so I mean, that's what, I, what I'm trying to, I guess, articulate in terms of what discomfort is to me, is this sensation that I'm having that makes me feel obliged to fill the space. Hmm. And what else could discomfort be for you? Oh, he's doing it. Yeah, I know. Do you see what he's doing? I do. I'm picking it up. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't for those know. listening on the podcast, Ryan's touching his <laughs> chest as he yeah, did you see that? I sensation. felt like Oprah for a minute. His, his heart rate just is. went up. He doesn't know how to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so for me, that's a that's a visual signal to go there because there's something there that Ryan hasn't said. Ooh, 
I yeah. don't know what it is though. Yeah, he's I'm like, I'm so trying insightful. to think of it what myself. I don't know. What <laughs> <I'm>... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not so insightful. Um, no, I mean, like I say, I know that this is a problem for me, and uh, and this is something that I do with regularity is jump in, but I don't I don't know how else to to articulate that. I know you're going for something, and there's must be something in in the subliminal part, but I'm having trouble accessing it. Hmm. And that's completely okay. So in an, in a real conversation, what I was most curious about, there was multiple times Ryan's touching the top of his chest. Now, for all of us, it's important for us to know there are more nerve endings in our gut than there are in our brain. Hmm. And we need to trust our gut feel more as Westerners. We, we live in a much more rational, logical way than people from other cultures, whether that's ancient cultures like Inuit or Aborigine or uh, tribal cultures from Central and Southern uh, America. One of the things we need to get good with is our gut feel is rarely wrong. In fact, when we go against our gut feel, it's when we get frustrated the most. So it's okay not to be able to get to a point where Ryan can express it in words but he knows he can feel this discomfort. He just can't explain it. So number one, well done, Ryan, for noticing. You know, in most conversations, you're not even going to notice that discomfort. You know, you wouldn't have even noticed that on the last interview that you've done. You were just, you, you're, you're on a roll. Uh, and number two, it's kind of just stay with it. It's not something that you want to fix. Just be with it is what I would say. It's like, okay, hello, discomfort, my good new friend. I have not <laughs> spent a lot of time with you. So we, we don't need to fix it. It's like fear. It's like fear plays a role, but sometimes we let fear in at the wrong time. And it's like, hi, fear, great to see you again. Uh, just for this conversation, just wait over here. So in that moment, Ryan, just practice with me. If you took a deeper breath, what would happen with discomfort in that moment? Well, now having had had you elaborate a little bit, so that to to put a finer point on the sensation I was feeling, it was more like a tenseness or a tightness in the chest. That's probably why I was going for it. Mm. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I can I could see how having controlled my breathing a little better may have caused me to not tense up quite so much or would have allowed me to sort of release that anxiety, whatever that was. Like, uh, I, you know, I'm very comfortable talking about that thing, but it's clearly something, I mean, I, I at least self-identify it as a problem. So I was experiencing mm. some kind of anxiety around that. Yeah. And lovely, you know, again, when you had the time to get those other 800 words out of your head, you went, oh, it's up here. It's in my chest. Yeah, it's interesting because, I mean, now that you say that, I mean, you know, uh, I said what I said. I, I had a minute to sort of think about it while you were having, you know, while you were rebutting that. And then as I came back, I had a more clear explanation of what it was that I was feeling, you know, more this, mm. this, I was able to at least pin it down and call it anxiety or tension or pressure or whatever. But I, I didn't have those words the first time we spoke or the, you mm. know, prior to your response. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I think that's very interesting. That's cool. And are you noticing that you're holding your breath while you're kind of going, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to interrupt. I'm liter literally holding my breath right now. Because <laughs> he wanted to interrupt. I could well, see it Well, I, I eyes. did. I actually had something like a, the the tenseness in your chest. Uh, I get that before I perform, like performance anxiety. And the last couple times that I went on stage and was in a performance environment, um, I, I've been focusing on meditation and breathing and, and I actually stepped off the side stage and took a couple deep breaths and it's amazing how much it, it calms you down and, and kind of gets your headspace right. So, and, and the, 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 that you pointed out that your nerve endings in your gut, uh, that's been like, I've been thinking about that for a while. I'm like, that makes so much sense. Uh, so yeah, thank you. <laughs> Look, where, whether whether I'm talking to world class opera singers or uh, what, you, what you are, host... by the way, <laughs> world class <laughs> opera singers, both of us, <laughs> Ryan over here, <laughs> <laughs> or I'm or I'm talking to uh, world class athletes or the world sniper champion. Uh, can you believe that there's uh, world championships for snipers? <laughs> 
So I interviewed one from three years ago, uh, a woman from Sweden, and she talked about the role of breathing and the role of noticing her breath and the role of noticing her breath and its synchronicity with a heartbeat. And they actually have to shoot in between the breath and the heartbeat. You know, oh, wow. that's how precise you can get. And that's world class focus in noticing your entire system. For most of us, we go through the day, we would never even dream to be at that level of focus. But whether you're an Olympic athlete lining up to go for a 100 meter sprint, uh, an opera singer, an FBI hostage negotiator, a sniper, the world memory Olympic champion, can you believe there's Olympics for memory? All these people consistently, no matter who I speak to in my research work, all come back to the importance of breathing to mm. centering them and becoming in a place and a state to be ready to perform at the highest level. And the same is true when it comes to listening. Do you uh, recommend any books that we could kind of dive further in depth uh, outside of yours? Yeah. <laughs> or including uh, yours. For, for breathing techniques uh, specifically? Uh, for breathing techniques, I'd probably recommend an app um, or apps to be honest, I, I'd recommend the Headspace app and I'd recommend the Insight Timer app. Both of those apps take you through a guided process in how to become conscious of your breathing and how to do it effectively, how to use it to be in those situations where you go, as Ryan just went, oh, I can feel tightness and you know this thing's rising up inside me. For those two apps, do a great job of taking you through it. Um, I don't, I don't have any strong recommendation on books because the feedback I've got from most people is uh, like listening. It's a practice, and the more you do it, the better you get at it. Well, makes it sense. makes perfect sense. I mean, especially around all this meditation and yoga and things like that. Like you know, there are some truths out there, right? Like this idea of you know listening to your gut and things like that. I mean, these, you know, ancient forms of, of controlling your breath and managing your uh, the way you react to things, things like that, have been with, you know, humankind for, you know, eons. And so it makes perfect sense that, you know, those sorts of things have borne out as true over the years. So it makes sense to probably stick with that kind of thing. Mm. Um, and, the, and the irony is most of these practitioners would say it's not about controlling your breath. It's actually being with your breath in its natural state. We, noticing we are, that you're hyperventilating or noticing <laughs> that like is is that kind of what you're correct okay sorry so yeah. i don't know we've gone so we're like near the end of our time but i wonder do you have time for one more quick question oscar of course okay i just wanted to ask you and we've, we've touched on little pieces of this but i wanted to put it into something a little more bite size so um one of the things that is uh, you know if you're the person organizing an event where you might have a speaker or you're speaking yourself, or you're hosting a meeting or something to this event, not unlike your Peter meeting early on. Um, mm. How do you make for a great listening environment? You mentioned a couple things like bottles of water and things like that. But if I'm going in, let's say, and just maybe selfishly asking this, but if, I, if I'm going to go into a meeting with a potential client, how might I prep the room, prep myself, prep them, et cetera, for the, the best type of listening environment I can offer? So in those meeting room situations, be conscious, like as lovely and as social as a coffee shop might be or a Starbucks, it's probably the least productive listening environment because there's too many visual and auditory distractions for you. So the quieter the meeting room that you can create, the better. That's the first step before you even get into the room. The second thing about the room is, do you need a table? Uh, or, can, or can you just bring the chair around to face the person you're talking to? So, you know, for one-on-one -on -one kind of situations, I, I would say be brave and just pay, pull the chairs out and just face them. You'll get a completely different listening experience and they will get a completely different attention, uh, paying, paying attention experience. Now, don't do that with your prospect at your first meeting do that with a <laughs> client that trusts you and has worked with you for a while otherwise they interpret that as an aggressive move and not it's not going to be a productive meeting for you uh, eye level to eye level and that's the other thing why does a why do you want your eyes at eye level to the other person uh, because your ears are at ear level so auditory paths are pretty close 
but eye level is also helping us listen through the visual uh, cues also for now, body language. You you mentioned earlier that uh, you'll set off at an angle and not be direct across. Is, can you expound on why you do that instead of being directly in front of them? Uh, directly in front is is probably more um, distant and on a side. There's a level of intimacy that's implied with that. That it, it's okay. I can be closer to you than necessarily oppositional to you. Hmm. So, uh, people who listen professionally, so uh, deaf interpreters, for example, or foreign language interpreters, or air traffic controllers, all of them will tell you this really interesting head tilt. So when you're really listening, you'll, you will tilt your head slightly forward into an angle. And the reason you're doing that, and you'll typically tilt your head to the right, is uh, you're getting more auditory signal through the right ear because it's connecting with the part of the brain that's listening for emotional cues better. So just that if you're noticing that slight tilt from the other person, uh, it's probably not because they're hard of hearing. It's because they're actually trying to listen for your emotion. So a lot of people might go, what does that sound like? So if you think about if my voice moves down here ever so slightly, it's a very different voice sound from where I was here. When I'm listening for vocal fry or vocal variation, all of a sudden it's, ah, there's a clue. When they mention their boss, they fried. Or when they mention the CFO, they fried. Uh, finally, Ryan, back to that table. If you have to sit at the table, if there are vases or things in the way, uh, speaker phones, move them all out of the way. Make, make that desk as clear as possible with a few things in between. If you have to take notes, uh, try, and try them analog. And by that, I mean, if you've got a, like an iPad with a stylus, that's analog enough for me. But avoid verbatim, like ri literally writing down the words they're saying. Try and just draw pictures. Pictures will capture the meaning faster. Pictures will capture the actions quicker because you're not going to remember those words anyway. Because what happens when you're writing words down in your brain, you say the words. And while you're saying the words, you're shutting down the auditory cortex in the brain, which means you can't actually listen to what they're saying while you're writing the words down verbatim. Whereas if you draw a quick sketch in a picture, you're engaging the visual cortex and you'll be able to listen to what they're saying as well. That's, so that's perfect for Ryan. Well, well, well that is really an interesting in. thing. I remember as a little kid, I used to get in so much trouble because I would sit and sketch and draw. Like I, I draw a lot, you know, as, and, and I'm artistic. And I remember it distinctly being a second grader and my, you know, sitting at like a parent-teacher conference or something like that. And my mom was getting sort of a rap from my teacher that Ryan just never pays attention. His eyes are always on the paper. He's always looking down. He's always doing whatever. I actually developed three different handwriting styles that year too. And so, um, <laughs> but I mean, but this was what I was doing. But for me, it really allowed me to focus. And so mm. maybe what you're saying is just sort of, you know, evidence of that point that, you know, I was drawing, but it wasn't taking me out of the conversation per se. Yeah. And for those of you who are listening to the podcast and not watching, the minute Ryan said his mum, his hand went to his chest because <laughs> he was talking about a situation of tension. All right. We're so going to get rid of the just... camera. The camera's gone. No more camera. <laughs> <laughs> we're so going to in, in, webcams. <laughs> in that moment, I just want to make a, a, a final observation. World-class listeners don't take notes because it's not my job to understand anything Ryan's saying. My job is to help them make sense of what they're thinking. So in practical business terms, you do need to take notes and actions because if you walk away from the meeting and you forget a big one, yeah, the client's going to walk away. But for most of the time, what surprises my clients when they work with me, I don't take any notes. I summarize the one thing I've taken away as the action from the meeting or the two things. And in my summarization, they'll go, yeah, that's it. Or they'll go, actually, no, it wasn't that, it was this. So there's a physicality to those meeting rooms, but paying attention and giving them as much eye contact as possible will completely transform the way you engage compared to your competition. Cool. All right. I think uh, I think that's a nice little bow to leave this uh, conversation tied up with. 
Um, my inclination is to keep asking you questions, though, so I will let you go. <laughs> this is a very hot topic for me right now, so I really appreciate your time. Oscar, can you uh, just let our listeners know where can they learn more about you, where can they find your uh, your many books, including uh, the Deep Listening deck of cards and everything else? Yeah, so if you want to get the one pathway to get the Deep Listening book, the playing cards, the jigsaw puzzles, the Apple Award-winning podcast many other things we're just kicking off an assessment to see if you're which one of those listening villains you are visit listeningmyths.com listeningmyths.com is the start and the finish for you to find out everything about the listening that you want to improve because honestly in my quest for 100 million deep listeners in the world i'm not going to get there in my lifetime but i think it's a quest worth going for yeah, I love that. I will give you a little pointer, though. That guy I mentioned earlier, Chris. Dove, I was going to bring that up earlier, his, but I was trying to yeah. listen well. <laughs> his his plan is to hit a billion people. His trick is, or as best as I can tell, and and I probably wouldn't say this to him, but my assessment you of, did his, say of it the to trick, him. you did say is it to him. China. That's the trick. <laughs> Take this to China. Put it in Mandarin, and you're you're golden. You've got a bunch bigger audience. You'll be perfect. I think he was heading to Hong Kong <laughs> that weekend, so he's like, "You're cheating." <laughs> <laughs> so cool. Ryan and Mike have given me the greatest gift of all. You've listened. Thanks for listening. (laughs) Thanks so much, Oscar. And and giving us your time. We really appreciate it. Awesome. All right. So, with that, thanks so much to everybody who's tuned into the live stream. Uh, Also, to everybody who's listening to this, downloading on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, everywhere good podcasts are found. Uh, Join us over at eggscast.com to watch the live streams, catch up on all the past episodes and everything else. And shoot us a note, get involved, get in the conversation, and let us know what you think, what you'd like to hear more of, less of, etc. And please rate, like, and subscribe. That's right. All right, everybody, we'll see you next week. Thanks so much, Oscar. Appreciate you.